I'd like to welcome Rosa and all of you to the live question and answer session of the seminar. Please ask your questions in the box on the screen and we will ask the most popular questions. So if there's one you'd like to see answered, please use the upvoting functions. Thank you so much for your talk, Rosa. And the first question, uh, first, it starts with a, a compliment that your presentation was so clear and then asks, do the SOX9 positive cells have a survival advantage in endometriosis and cancer? And are the SOX9 positive cells more able to migrate from the uterus? Yeah, thank you so much for, for your questions. I think it's, yeah, it's a really good point. So, so this is something that, that we are investigating. We don't know yet with the data we have, because in the endometriosis, actually, it could be both cases that you can migrate farther, uh, and that's why you are going to other tissues, but also, as, as you mentioned, that you can have better survival, right? Because you are SOX9 and you are a progenitor. So I think it, it could be both. I mean, yeah, what, what we also want to investigate is, is just, we are recapitulating kind of the cell of origin or is just the signature of, of the real survival. Um, I think for all these questions, having models such as the organoids, because the problem with the mouse is that the endometrium is so different, so it's not a good model, but start to explore this in, in the organoids and derive organoids from, from disease would be a good way to, to address these questions and, and see and evaluate the, the survival and, and the migratory capacity of, of those cells. Mm -hmm. So a few, more, more future work, definitely. Hi, Rosa, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I think you showed that in serious, serious endometrial cancers, that they tended to be SOX9 positive, uh, LGR5 positive population. So I was just wondering if you could comment, the kind of question is, is does this suggest that targeting the wind pathway might be particularly important in the setting of that particular patient population? And of course there are drugs now that target things like the porcupine inhibitor, which is involved in activation of the wind signaling pathway. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we also thought about and the same for, for endometriosis. If by targeting wind and not, we, or we, can, we can really um, induce, for example, the cells to differentiate and then in a way remove the, their, their survival um, or reduce their survival. Again, this, I think this is just preliminary data because we are looking at healthy tissue and there will be like more assays that that we will need to do and also explore like the, the disease right at least we have a reference where we can compare um and again uh, i may be a bit repetitive but i think the use of organoids and starting to evaluate this will will be great and and at the moment we were just doing some some inhibitors that that were for more for the experiments, but they start testing like proper drugs will, will be will be great. And again, I guess the other thing will be to to make them targeted to to the uterus. Yeah. Um, and and just because you mentioned the use of organoids, and you've obviously used, I guess. Um, organoids that are derived from healthy tissue, if I understood correctly. I wonder if you could comment on what the state of play was in terms of, you know, endometrial tumor organoids, whether those were something that could be grown and could you grow the different populations that you identified, for example, through your transcriptomic profiling? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so basically, yeah, so far as you mentioned, we, we were just to stick to, to healthy endometrial tissue. And again, our, our idea was to just focus on healthy because this, tissue change a lot and without a healthy reference, it, it is impossible to, to understand disease. But it's true that um, there has been derived organoids from diseases and even endometrial lesions. So it is possible to, to derive them and they grow really good. So I, yeah, again, I don't expect any problem because it is a regenerative tissue. So 
So yeah, even for healthy, it grows like super well. So there is also some studies where in the endometriosis, for example, in the they derive from the lesions, and not sorry, in the mitral cancer, I think, and they also see higher expression of SOX9. And that really, in a way, recapitulates that the organoids uh, may be really recapitulating what happens in, in the disease, which is quite exciting. And actually, this is something, something that we are also building in the, in the lab in collaboration with, um, with teams in Oxford to try and derive also an endometriosis organoids. And, and really, the first thing is to understand how well they they are recapitulating the, the heterogeneity. And, and again, I think that the, also the other problem with endometriosis, I guess, is that we know very little, but it is an heterogeneous disease. And I think when we start to characterize the different kind of um, subtypes, we will also be better at, at doing correlations with, with other things. Then the, the other thing is that so far, I'm focusing on, on the epithelial um, bit of the story because you can derive organoids from the epithelial cells. In the case of endometriosis, you also have a lot of contribution from the stromal compartment. And there are some, some models to co-culture stromal and epithelial, but there is a, a lot of work to, to be done in, in, in that area. And this is not something that I'm not a cellular biologist and I'm not trying to do these co-cultures myself, but I know there are a lot of people working on that. And I think, especially for endometriosis, that, that will really be key to, to understand this dialogue and how, because what we see as well is that for differentiation or for the homeostasis of the tissue, you also need this dialogue between a stromal and, and, and epithelial cells. So I think building all, all these models will be also helpful. And again, I think having our reference is great because you can compare to something and, and see if, if your model is, is really recapitulating or if in those models are really cells share, like sharing signals or not. But yeah, I think, um, just as a summary of everything, I think there, are, there is promising results indicating that endometrial organoids derived from disease have some hints from, from, from these disorders, which is great. And, and epithelial are such a, an important compartment that just studying this will be, will be amazing. Thank you. Roger. Thank you. I think the next question um, asks about whether you could elaborate on the interactions between estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor and the hormonal environment with wind and notch signaling and how, how you can start to unpick that. Yeah, that's a, a good question, thank you. So. Yeah, we, what we did to, to start intermingle all of this uh, at this stage was to put inhibitors with and without the hormones. It was a lot of conditions. And then, yeah, we could see that, well, without hormones, you don't have notch expressions. So then it, it is impossible to, to derive glands even if you, derive, if you add wind. So in a way, expression of notch is, is essential. And to, to differentiate the cell. So the, sorry, the expression of hormones or the presence of hormones is essential to, to derive the, 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 the cell fate of, of, the, of the epithelial cells and just the environment will contribute to, to, to increase efficiency or decrease. So of course, for us, it was uh, a lot of conditions and just sharing and looking for a specific transcription factors, which are all detailed in, in the manuscript in Bioarchive. I think also moving forward, what it will also be really interesting is to start doing CRISPR-Cas9 technologies to disentangle all these transcription factors that we see induced by the hormones and by the wind and not inhibitors. Um, and, and this is relevant because uh, in a way for two things. I mean, one, because a lot of therapy with hormones have other detrimental effects on women, which is not great. 
and also because there are some com conditions and endometrial cancers that cannot respond to hormones. So I think having these links of these pathways being linked to 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 the hormones is 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 really interesting. It is really interesting. Yes, and one would think with the increasing use of hormones and fertility treatments as well that you know that you're fueling fueling this environment. Thank you, Rosa. Great. So, Rosa, the next question, I guess, touches a bit on something we've touched on before, but I think it'd be worth elaborating more explicitly. So, how does comparing organoids versus biopsies using single cell RNA seq? What does this tell you about the cell types that are actually absent from the organoid culture for signaling in the endometrium? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, that to me, that that's a, um, a big question, right? And in our case, just maybe to, to be more specific and then I can be more broad. For example, we see that our organoids are only epithelial, right? And we see that they cannot differentiate completely in the secretory lineage, which for us, it was fine because we were studying the response to hormones. But to be honest, for example, we know that in vivo, we, we do need the supporting the stromal cells for producing wind inhibitor, and that will make the, the endometrium fully differentiate. So I think that's a clear example on how to con comparing these in vitro organoids with the in vivo reference allows us to, to, to see things that are missing in the in vitro models because they are produced by others. And that you can either do co-culture systems, which are more difficult and um, yeah, as I said, also more difficult to scale, I guess, for me and for other people at Sanger, for a lot of organoids we, we do, not only on this, but in others. And I guess, Matthew, for you, the same, you're thinking about the scaling and that's where the beauty of the organoids are, right? So I think by comparing, you can supply the, the media with a specific things that will will usually be provided by the surrounding cells. And because we want, in a way, simplistic models, but we want to scale them and to do um, screenings and derive them from multiple individuals, we, can, we cannot have the luxury to do all these complex um, complex co-cultures and, and systems. Maybe in the future, I'm sure we will, right? But just learning this, we, we can really improve the model. Um, the organoid by, by really recapitulating the microenvironment by just targeting the pathways. I don't know if that's responding to your question. No, no, that does. And I guess maybe you could just comment on how, how cell phone DB might help with that because that, that's a really useful tool. Yeah, so, so in a way, cell phone DB, what it does is to look for a specific ligand receptors that, that you have in the single cell or in a tissue in this case where we integrated with also special data. So also moving forward, and, and this is still unpublished, um, Luz, who is also the, the first author of this paper, has been integrating all these ligand receptors with downstream signaling. And of course, it's for a limited pathways because we don't know all of them. But still, we can establish links with the ligand receptors and some of the downstream pathways. And, and that's relevant, right? Because if you know the pathway, then you can su supplement this pathway in the organoid. So in a summary, what we do, and again, this was an example with, I decided to focus my talk in, in one word, but um, I, I would like to have the opportunity to say that you can do this in, and we are doing it in a lot of tissues where you, you can explore the, the ligand receptors and the downstream signaling, and then just with self and DB, you will have this information. And again, you will have a lot of candidates. So it requires you to, to also do some screening in the in vitro, like you have one specific pathway and you target. Uh, and then with this information, you can start testing dif different media um, in, the, yeah, in the organoid. And again, for the transcription factor, we, we are measuring, measuring activity so far in single cell is, is challenging. And that's why we are measuring the expression and also the activity here in this case, always transcriptome and we use this Dorothea um, 
which was developed with Luz in, 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 in Julio Saez Rodriguez's uh, team, but uh, we are also using for this other project information about the attack data to also gain insights into the transcription factors and not only one transcription factor, but the whole network. So yeah, I think going from outside to inside, it's super interesting question. And I think you can achieve this by integrating different layers of, of single cell, spatial and, and, and attack, for example. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, this question here that asks whether your work is helping define the potential links between endometriosis and increased abuse of uterine cancer. Are, are they linked? Is the inflammatory environment linking them? So as far as I know, I don't think there is a clear link between, between both diseases. It is also true what I was kind of saying before, that we know very little about endometriosis, maybe we know a bit more about endometrial cancer. So probably there are a lot of, dif I mean, for sure there are a lot of different lesions, right? And again, my, my, my work that I presented here, just wanted to give us an insight on how we can, we can use this atlas to get insights into endometriosis, but it was not really planning to do a classification of the endometriosis lesions. For this, we will need to profile endometriosis samples which yeah we are planning anyways but i think we maybe by defining more subsets maybe we can see that there is a specific subset that is kind of linked to to endometrial cancer and and these then we can see the composition but so far my, my understanding as far as i know um but i am also more genomics i am not a clinician so maybe there will be links that I'm missing, but what uh, I am aware is that there is not a clear link. Okay, thanks. We seem to have lost Julia for a minute, but um, um, I can ask certainly the next next question. So maybe you could correct me if I'm wrong, Rosa. So my understanding is one of the limitations of single cell RNA-seq is that you don't measure all transcripts and, and, and particularly any kind of lowly expressed transcripts are more difficult to, to measure. And I just wondered if you could comment, you know, I guess more broadly about how that impacts your ability to understand the activation of pathways when actually you have a kind of sparsity in terms of what you're measuring. And then maybe for the audience, you could tell us what Dorothea does, why you used it, and then, you know, maybe say, you know, how this sparsity actually even impacts on your, your interpretation of the Doroth Dorothea results. Yeah, that, uh, thank you for that question. So, I mean, first I want to see, I will give my insights because we haven't done a proper benchmark and because it was not the tool that I developed self on DV, I haven't developed uh, Dorothea, but a lot of the, of the work we, we do on single cell, it's at the level of, of the cluster. I mean, it depends. Sometimes we look correlation at the level of single cell and that's where, for example, for pathway school, could work because you have a lot of cells so you can look for a lot of correlations. But to be honest, a lot of um, the analysis we, we do for, for, for example, for in our case, Dorothea, I know there is an application for single cell, but we were using it at the level of cluster, which is kind of a mini bulk. So then you wouldn't have a lot of dropouts. It's also true, we, we also sequence quite deep in our data. So we have a lot of genes per cell and if we consider at the level of cluster we actually don't have a lot of dropouts so in my experience and again i haven't been quantitative or don't have any smart because it is not my tool i i couldn't see any any problem with that um just to uh, as a very short um inside what dorothea is doing is which is a way to, to look for activity that is complementary to others that we will use for attack. In this case, what, what we are looking is at the targets, at a consensus target of a specific transcription factors. And again, um, this is a work that we didn't do in, in the team, but we are highly using it. Right, so you use that consensus 
the targets of the transcription factors as a proxy for the activity of that transcription factor in, in those subtypes. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. in other words, for example, we combine it, the activity of the transcription factor by, by looking at tab where you look at the specific binding motif, which again, it's, it's a, a different way to, to, there is, I don't think there is a correct way to measure the transcription factor activity. And a lot of times it doesn't overlap with because they are just measuring different things. But it's really, I think, having an overview also and considering the expression, we are, a lot of time we, we consider the expression because it's a direct measure. And if we want to explore, I mean, in this case, we tell not targets are well-defined, but in a lot of cases, and we work a lot on development, the, the targets are not well-defined because it's just a new transcription factor. And in this case, um, those tools may not be useful. So I think you need to define your problem and we like it a lot. And for this case, it helps a lot, but of course it relies on having defined targets. Yeah. Great, thank you. Sorry, I vanished uh, earlier. I, I'm back. But we've got a question about whether in the endometrium, whether glandular cells migrate from the base of the crypt to become ciliated cells, similar to what happens in colonic crypts. Yeah, that's a good question. So in the, I mean, in the first instance, we, the pathway, it doesn't go through secretory and ciliated. So it goes from the progenitor to the secretory or ciliated. That's the, the common pathway that we see. And because we have clonal organoids and that was derived by Margarita Turco team, we, can, we could check that, yeah, the, the, there is a common progenitor for both. Right. We also see that, um, some cells in our single cell and spatial data that are expressing both luminal and ciliated markers, just indicating that maybe there is some cells that can shift from being more kind of towards secretory and going to acylate it as it happens in the gut. But again, we will need to do lineage tracing experiments with, for example, the organoids to show that this is like the correct trajectory and at the moment, we, we haven't done because with single cell you can reconstruct trajectories, but they are just based on similarities on the transcript. Mm -hmm. And it could, it's a trajectory, but it could be a pseudo space thing, I mean, a migration. So uh, I think that it could be possible that there is this kind of transition from secretory to ciliated for a few cells, not the common pathway, uh, but we will need linear tracing to confirm. That's, that's fabulous, thank you. And, and Rosa, we're getting near to the end of your time. So I was just gonna take a step back a bit and ask you a kind of human cell atlas level question. So putting you on the spot. So, you know, the human cell atlas is a huge international project involving, you know, hundreds of scientists. So I guess, you know, and you've obviously had a, a role in that and, and been very involved in that effort. So I was gonna ask you, you know, what do you think have been some of the most important findings to date from the human cell atlas? Yeah, I think, I mean, there are three main areas maybe that I think in my point of view uh, are, are relevant. So the first thing is how maybe by working like quite closely to each other and um, I'm working more in the reproductive atlas, for example, we have managed to, these, to build these healthy atlases and really to discover a lot of things that were unknown so far. And for example, we work a lot in development and there we define a lot of cell types that we had no clue uh, before. And I think that has been exciting and also by computing with others too. So I think that's one of exploring like um, environments that were unexplored so far has been quite exciting. And the, for example, one example was my um, my work in, plac in the placenta during my postdoc. The other thing has been to utilize this to better understand disease. And it, not only having the, the disease atlases, that of course helps, but even the healthy atlas, we could detect the expression of of genes that are generally involved in disease and identify new cell states or new locations that are expressed in those diseases. And this could be powerful for, for example, even in the under interpretation of GWAS analysis, right? And you find a, a target and you know what cell can, can be a target for that. 
And finally, and I think what is one of the things that excites me the most is to utilize all these models to, to make better in vitro models. And there are a lot of, of examples for that where you can start yeah, changing pathways and, and comparing. And for all of us to do human research, that that's really a, having a reference is what the first step to, to build an, an in vitro model. So I think maybe those uh, are the three highlights. Okay, yeah, that's very good. Very interesting, thank you. Thank you. We're coming to the top of the hour, so while we've got more questions, I think we'll have to close. But we need to thank Rosa once again for her brilliant presentation and for joining us for the question and answer, se question and answer session, and also for the audience who joined this virtual session. We are now taking a summer break from the seminar series for July and August, but we plan to be back in September showcasing Sanger Science, so please look out for further announcements closer to the time. In the meantime, if you are missing your fix of monthly science, a reminder that these seminars and the question and answer sessions are archived on these web pages for your future viewing. And we've been delighted that this series has allowed us to share Sanger Science with such a diverse audience around the world. So thank you once again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you in the autumn.